No, it seems quite fitting that here we are a week and a half after the presidential elections here in the United States, and we join with Christians from around the world today celebrating Christ the King, declaring that Jesus is the one who is really in charge. The true Messiah does not appear every four years. We say Christ is King, not as a consolation, but as a proclamation. As Christians down through the ages have said it, even as they face the harsh blows of persecution. And even today in some places to say Jesus is Lord may seem an audacious claim or foolish naivete. But to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. Now we've been considering for some weeks now the parables of Jesus and the treasures of understanding and wisdom found in them. Jesus taught in parables, of course, in order to impart better understanding of God's kingdom and, and knowledge of kingdom values. You know, like the prophet Jeremiah said, call to me and I will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things you do not know. The true followers of Jesus seek these kingdom values and are motivated to learn of him. And maybe some of us need to pray, Lord, give me the desire to know more of you and to know your values. For the key to understanding the parables, really the key for all the Christian life and life as Christian people is found in one person, Jesus Christ. So this man goes up to a, uh, into a, hotel, a motel lobby, and he goes up to the desk, and he's going to check in there, and he sees a large dog lying in front of the desk. The dog made him nervous. You know, he's a little uncomfortable around dogs. So uneasy, the man asks the de desk clerk, does your dog bite? The desk clerk simply said, no. And so with that assurance, the man bent down to pet the dog. Just as he put his hand down, the dog bit him sharply. And in great pain, he said, I thought you said your dog doesn't bite. I did. But he bit me. And here's the desk clerk's response. Sir. That is not my dog. <laughs> now I hope you see the vital importance of asking the right questions. The story is told of Elvis Presley. Who here doesn't know who Elvis Presley was? Kimberly? Kimberly? You ever heard of Elvis Presley? Who was he? The king of rock and roll. Very good. Thank you. Just check it. So the story is told of Elvis Presley that when at the very last minute before one of his performances, a substitute hairstylist was brought in for him, never met the guy before, Elvis says to him, hey, uh, so what are you into? He wanted to know a little bit about this man who's going to prepare him for this performance. He wanted to have a little personal connection with this guy. So, hey man, what are you into? And the man replied to Elvis, I've been obsessed by three questions. Where did I come from? What is my purpose here? And where am I going? And Elvis replied, me too. <laughs> These are really the vital questions to ask. They're not new questions. They've been around for millennia. People spend their lives seeking answers to these questions. Religions are built on finding or providing answers to these questions. And Christianity proclaims 
that the answers are found in that one person, Jesus Christ. And yet immediately, it raises another vital question. Who is this Jesus Christ that in him I should find answers to my existence? Where did he come from? Why did he come? And what difference does his coming make to my life anyway? Now Jesus himself knew that this was the question of the ages. He asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they offered him four responses. Some say you're John the Baptist. Some say you're Elijah returned. Some say you're the prophet Jeremiah or one of the other, and some say you're one of the other prophets. Even when he walked on this earth, people were confused about his true identity. And that discussion has continued to this very day. I dare you to go on some internet religious chat room and there you're going to find a vast array of opinions regarding Jesus. Go in one of those chat rooms and throw out the question, who's Jesus Christ? You'll get answers like this. He's a good man. He's the son of God. He's a prophet. He's a Galilean rabbi. He's a teacher of God's law. The embodiment of God's love. I, lo I, I, I like this one here. A reincarnated spirit master. <laughs> or you'll get an answer like he's the ultimate revolutionary. He's the Messiah of Israel. He's a savior. He's a first century wise man. A man just like any other man. King of kings. A misunderstood teacher. Lord of the universe. A deluded religious leader. Son of man. A fabrication of the early church. Which one do you go with? So after Jesus asked the opinions of others, he turned to his men and he asked for their answers. But you, who do you say that I am? You know, every one of us, especially if we're here this morning, face the same question. And we can't get away with quoting the opinion of others. you got to make up your own mind. It's not enough to say, well, I believe in Jesus. Millions of people can say that and then fill them with all their ideas and desires and hopes. But the real Jesus, found in the affirmation of Christians for the past 2,000 years, is the only Jesus that counts. For 2,000 years, Christians have affirmed their faith in Jesus with these words from the Apostles' Creed, which we just recited a little bit ago. I believe in Jesus, Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord. Now, I don't know if you counted the words when they were up on the screen, but just to save you the time, let me tell you. Of the 110 words in the Apostles' Creed, 70 of those words occur in the section relating to Jesus Christ. That tells us something. He is the heart and the core of what we believe. You can be mistaken about some secondary issues and still be a Christian. But if you're wrong about Jesus, well, your life depends upon being right about him. Faith in Jesus has got to be more than just having Jesus in my heart, some sort of warm emotional experience. That's, that's a good start, but our faith must rest on the revealed truth about Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord. There's four statements and the Apostles' Creed that lay out this truth. I believe in Jesus. I believe he is the Christ, 
I think we need another slide up there. There we go. I believe he is God's only son. I guess, I'm sorry, Ed. Yeah, I followed. I got you ahead of there. My, my fault, not his. I believe he is the Lord. So theologian J.I. Packer notes that when the creed begins by calling God the maker of the heavens and earth, it immediately apart's company from Hinduism and most other Eastern religions. And then when the creed declares that Jesus is the Christ, God's only son and our Lord, it immediately parts company with Islam and Judaism. This makes Christianity unique in the world. So let's take a look at the answers that the Apostles' Creed gives to the question, who is Jesus Christ? First point. There we go. He is the Savior. Remember, the creed says, I believe in Jesus. The name Jesus actually means God saves. Scholars tell us that it was actually a, a very common name among the Jews in the first century. In fact, historical records show there were at least 10 other men named Jesus who lived in Judea about the same time as our Lord. So if, if records show there were 10 others, there were probably hundreds. There were at least five Jewish high priests who were named Jesus. Okay? The high priest, the head guy. Several before and after Jesus were named Jesus. The name itself is the Greek version of the Old Testament name, Joshua. You've all heard that. Yeshua in Hebrew. It speaks of the fact that God has entered the human race on a rescue mission coming from heaven. And that's why the angel said to Joseph, you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. So when we say we believe in Jesus, we mean that he came to save us from our sins. Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. He is your Savior today, and he'll be your Savior tomorrow. He gave himself for you. He loves you still. And he invites you to come to him. The second point from the Apostles' Creed is that he is the Christ. Now, Christ is not Jesus' last name. He didn't grow up in the Christ family. People call me Pastor Richard. But Pastor is not my name. It's my title. To be precise, we should call Jesus the Christ, for Christ is his title. It's, it's one of the divinely appointed titles given him. The word Christ actually comes, again, from a Greek word. Now, how many of you are asking, what's with this, the Greek word and the Hebrew word? You need to understand. The Old Testament was originally written in Hebrew, the ancient Hebrew language of Israel. The New Testament, the Gospels and the letters and all that, were written in the common language of that part of the world, the Eastern Mediterranean world at that time, which was Greek. So sometimes they translated things from the Old Testament into the common language, the Greek. So it went from the Hebrew to Greek. Now it's come to English. So that's why I'm throwing this out. So the word Christ comes from a Greek word that, it's, that itself comes from a Hebrew word that means the anointed one. We often translate that as the Messiah. To call Jesus the Christ means that he is the one sent from God to bring God to us and to bring us to God. God anointed him for this special task. So at Christmas time, when we sing, we sing, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus, we are referring to this truth that he is the Christ. 
In one way or another, everything in the Bible fits around this great theme. The Old Testament says he's coming. The Gospels say he's here. The book of Acts says he's come. The epistles say he is Lord. And Revelation says he's coming again. So in the next few weeks, we're actually going to be looking at some of these Old Testament promises about Jesus so that we'll have a better understanding during the season of Advent as we prepare for Christmas just who he was, really. Here's the third point that we get from the Apostles' Creed. He is God's only Son. There's one little word in there that's very important. It tells us something crucial, crucial about Jesus' relationship to God the Father. In the King James translation of John 3.16, anybody here know John 3.16 by heart? Can you say it with me? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever should believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. We are told that God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. What is only begotten? Does anybody here ever use begotten, only begotten? I mean, what does that word mean? Well, it comes from a Greek word again, monogenes. Mono means one or only, as in monologue. I'm the one and only one speaking right at this moment. At least I hope so, or think so. And the genus or genus part is related to our English words of gene and genetics and gender, you know? So when you put those two together, we have a word that means one of a kind, and there can never be another of the same kind. The term stresses the absolute unique nature of Jesus Christ. Because the Son shares in the same essential nature as the Father, Jesus could say, I and the Father are one. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. And Jesus, while on this earth, was the human face of God. The Nicene Creed, which is another one of our creeds, I'm talking about the Apostles' Creed this morning, but the Nicene Creed, by the way, you can find these creeds in the back of our hymnal. They're printed there for you. I'd encourage you to go to the Nicene Creed sometime and ponder that. It says it so succinctly of who Jesus is. It says, He is very God of very God. Begotten, not made. He is God the Son and thus worthy of the same worship, adoration, praise, and reverence that we give to God the Father. Now I know there's a lot of people today, including some Christian theologians and also philosophers and teachers and men, even church members, who don't really like this God the Son stuff. They still fight against this truth, the only begotten Son. They want a Christ, that is a Messiah, who is somehow divine, but, you know, not truly God. I don't know how you quite do that. They want a Jesus who's a good role model, but they do not want him as their God. It's very simple to understand. If Jesus is really God in flesh, if Jesus really is divine, then we have to take all his words and directions seriously. If he's just another man or even a good teacher, we can take him or leave him, right? But the Bible doesn't really give us that option. Let me share with you what C.S. Lewis said about this, how he explained it. You all know who C.S. Lewis was? He was an English writer. He wrote the famous children's books, the Narnia Chronicles. The, Li the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe was the first one. Made into movies several years ago. Great children's stories. 
with an underlying Christian theme in all, in, through them all. He also, by the way, if you haven't read them, even, even as an adult, they're worth reading. They're fun books. But he's, he's written also a number of very serious theological books. And you know what? You might pick up one of his books, like uh, Mere Christianity. That's a good start. Or I, I love The Great Divorce. It's not what you think it is. Um, the Weight of Glory. They're all just really thin little books like this, so they look like they're going to be easy to read, fast to read through, but you start reading C.S. Lewis and you go, oh man, I've got to read this sentence three or four times because he packs so much in there. So listen here. Here's what he says about this Jesus. He says, I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people, people often say about him. They say, I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on a level with a man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him or kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. And he still asks, Jesus does, and these are my words now, who do you say that I am? Here's the fourth statement or truth that comes from the Apostles' Creed. He is our Lord. This is another title given to Jesus. The title that actually relates to you and me. He is our Lord. The Greek word there in the Gospels or in the uh, Apostles' Creed also is kurios. It was actually a very common word. It's found throughout the New Testament, really. And it was common throughout the Roman Empire. Kurios, it means Lord. It really has a meaning a little bit more than we might think. It means in that particular situation for those people, he is absolute ruler. Now you all know my wife comes from an island country in the South Pacific. Her sister does too, by the way. Um, and seafaring has been part of their culture and lifestyle for a couple thousand years. And what is the captain of a ship called in your language? Eikivaka, Lord of the ship. Now I want you to get the understanding of this. That word Lord was used throughout the Roman Empire, meaning the one in that particular situation who has power over those people. Like in her language, Lord of the ship, he has absolute power when that thing is at sea. Everybody on there must obey the Lord. So it is a common term. And so when Christians said Jesus is Lord, they were saying something freighted with a lot of understanding that people would get. But they didn't say Jesus is Lord of inside the church. They said he's Lord of the whole universe. Now, to call Jesus Lord means that he is sovereign over your life and over mine and over the entire universe. Romans 10, 9 says this. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord 
and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now, I, I want you to understand this context here. The Romans, at the time of Jesus, ruled a vast empire. It stretched from Britannia, England, all the way to Syria, and everything around the Mediterranean Sea. The Mediterranean Sea was a Roman lake. They controlled it all. And so in order to rule this vast empire, they required really only two things. That taxes be paid, and that everyone say Caesar is Lord. Now, if you stood in a public gathering out in the marketplace and you cried out, Jesus is God, no one would be upset. Most people will walk by and say, oh, that's great, so what? But if you shouted, Jesus is Lord, you're going to start a riot and be in big trouble. And yet Christians say whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. Let's be clear here. Rome did not persecute Christians because they believed in the deity of Christ or that Jesus was the promised Messiah or that Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead. You know, I could substitute North Korea. Kim Jong mentally ill or whatever the guy's name is this, this, these days who's over there. Doesn't persecute Christians because they say he's Messiah or died on the cross rose from the dead. Rome did not kill Christians because they said Jesus is the only way of salvation. Those were religious beliefs and so they didn't threaten Caesar and the state. As long as you kept it inside the church walls, it's fine. But when Christians declared, Jesus Christ is our Lord, and there is no other Lord, that's when the trouble started. And Caesar felt like it was a direct attack as, on his position as absolute ruler, and thus punishable by death. Why do you think Christianity is driven out in communist nations? Because really, the communist Ideology says the state is Lord of all of your life. You belong to the state. And Christians say, no, I belong to Jesus Christ. When Christians proclaimed Jesus as Lord, they were accused either of atheism, because they didn't believe Caesar was God, or they were accused of sedition, undermining the state's power. To call him Lord means that we surrender all we have to him and we follow him gladly wherever he leads and whatever it costs. To call him Lord means he's sovereign over my life, not only on Sunday morning inside these walls, but every other day of the week outside these walls, even if other people don't like it. So let's return to our original question. Who is Jesus Christ that he should have anything to do with me? And you know that people say many things in answer to that question. I want you to know that the Christian believer states unequivocally that he is Savior, he is the Messiah, he is God's only Son. He is our Lord. When we say, I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, we are saying what we firmly believe and hold dear in the core of our hearts and our minds. And those very beliefs are what drive, influence, color, direct our lives. And we confess this to be true regardless of what others may believe. And we do it regardless of any opposition that may come our way. 
You know, a day is coming when at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Will you confess him now with joy as your Lord and Savior? Or will you risk someday confessing him as Lord in shame and fear? I bow my knee and worship him today. Who do you say he is? In him are the lasting treasures of true life. He is the great treasure of God's kingdom. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together.